Okay, welcome to part two of our practice exam review. If you would like to get the practice exam or the study guide, uh, the links are below. Um, there will also be cards in the top right corner that you can click on and it'll take you to uh, the site so you can get access um, to either the exam or the study guide um, or both if you want it. Um, so if you're enjoying this, like and subscribe and then um, I'll keep putting out these videos uh, every week. So here we go, let's go, part two. Um, number 11, which of the following is a type of discontinuous measurement? Okay, so remember we have two types of measurement on the RBT exam, we have continuous and we have discontinuous. So if you know your categories, this is a very straightforward question, okay, because um, three of them are gonna be continuous, right? So if we look at it, we have frequency, rate, duration, and partial interval, okay? So if you, you've been looking at your study guide, you know that frequency, rate, and duration are continuous. So D has to be the answer. Now let's say you forget, okay, on the test, the, the difference, all right? Let's look at this word, discontinuous, okay? So when we're doing continuous measurement, we're recording every instance of the behavior, okay, throughout, let's say, the entire session. Discontinuous, we're only recording in a small period of time, okay? So what measurements would we be using to record every instance of behavior, okay? Frequency, yes, because you're counting every time it happens. Rate is just frequency with time, okay? Duration, so anytime the behavior happens, you're just taking the duration. Remember with interval recording, we're picking a certain amount of time and then breaking it up in intervals, okay? So we're picking 10 minutes at a time or 15 minutes, okay? So by nature, this is discontinuous, okay? Because it doesn't happen the entire time you're with the client. It only happens during a portion of the time, okay? So two ways to look at this question. Either way, the answer is D. Okay, 12. What is the goal of a preference assessment? Don't get fooled here, right? So we have preference assessments or stimulus preference assessment, and we have reinforcer assessments, okay? What is the difference between a preference and a reinforcer? Well, not all preferences are going to change behavior, okay? Just because you like Kool-Aid doesn't mean you're willing to work for Kool-Aid, okay? Just because a kid likes Thomas the Train doesn't mean they're willing to work for Thomas the Train, okay? However, in a preference assessment, we're not looking for what they're willing to work for, okay, or what's gonna reinforce them. We just wanna know what they like, okay? So let's look at our answers. Find out what is reinforcing to the client. No, if this said, what is the goal of a reinforcer assessment, then yes, A would be correct. But we're looking for what they like, not what is reinforcing, okay? B, determine punishers for the individual. It's the, the opposite of preference, right? We're not looking for punishers here, okay? It's not a punisher assessment. C, identify stimuli that may be motivating. Perfect, keywords here, may be motivating, okay? May be, not saying it will be motivating, but we're just saying, okay, Timmy likes Thomas the Train, he likes Disney movies, and he likes Cheetos, okay? Maybe we can use these to motivate him, okay? These are what he prefers, okay? They might be motivating, okay? What about D? Always read every answer, even if you are 100% positive, okay? D, allow the client to choose what they want to work on during session. Uh, this doesn't have anything to do with the preference assessment, okay? We're looking for stimuli here, okay? What do they like? So it has to be C. Remember, just because they prefer it doesn't make it motivating <clears throat> and doesn't make it reinforcing. 13. You're teaching your client to say bubble. Your client says buh, and you deliver reinforcement. Next time your client says buh, you don't deliver reinforcement. Instead, you wait until your client says bub. You repeat this process and slowly increase the requirements for reinforcement up until your client says bubble. What are you implementing? So what are we doing here, okay? Your client says buh, reinforcement. Next time he says buh, you say, oh, very good, but let's, but you don't give them reinforcement, okay? And then you, you prompt them to say bub, okay? So you're trying to increase or the approximation of that word, okay? That key word there, approximation, successful approximations, okay? So what are we doing here? 
this should be an easy question, okay? It really should. If you know your definitions and you're looking at the study guide, this is an easy question, okay? You are shaping, right? You're looking at successful approximations of a behavior and reinforcing along the way, okay? Shaping is very powerful. It's how we, we, we teach new behaviors and strengthen new behaviors. And especially when you're doing functional communication training, you wanna be shaping that language constantly, okay? So shaping is the answer. Is it task chaining? Uh, no, it, it does kind of look like a chain, but if you know your definitions, you know this is not task chaining, right? Functional communication training, yeah, I mean, you might be tempted to pick that, right? Because technically this is communication training, but what's the best answer? The best answer is shaping, okay? Get, you always wanna go with what is the most specific best answer, right? So yes, maybe you could consider this SCT, but the best answer and the most exact answer is shaping. And then D, punishment. No, right? We're not talking about decreasing any behaviors, right? We're actually in talking about behavior changing, okay? So we're not decreasing anything. We're not punishing anything, okay? So the answer is A. 14, you're trying to teach your client to wash your hands. Your BCBA instructs you to use backwards chaining to te teach this. What step might you teach first? Please don't miss chaining questions, okay? The answer is in the... Uh, the uh, term, right? Backwards chaining, okay? So we have forward chaining, we have backwards chaining, we have total task chaining. What are we doing backwards chaining? We start backwards, right? So if you're washing your hands and we're gonna teach it backwards, what, was, what would we start with, right? Well, what's the first thing you teach, okay? Turning the water on. Well, that's not the last thing we do in, in washing hands, so no. Putting soap on their hands, that's in the middle, so no. Drying their hands off with a towel, Pretty good, right? Last thing you do when you wash your hands, you dry your hands off, right? All done. And D, enter the bathroom. That's the first thing you do, okay? Don't miss this question, okay? If they ask for forward chaining, it's the same thing. What's the first step you would do in the chain? That's what you're teaching. Backwards chaining, same thing. What's the last step? That's what you're teaching first, okay? Remember, backwards chaining, we prompt through the whole task and then reinforce for independently doing the last step of the task, okay? And then once they get that down, we prompt through and they need to do the second to last and last step, okay? Don't miss the chaining question, guys. Super easy, okay? So again, what are we gonna teach last? The last thing in the chain, trying hands off. 15, a student stands up and walks around the room in a, at inappropriate times. You decide you're going to deliver reinforcement on a FI3 reinforcement schedule for the students sitting in their chair. The student gets up and walks around, no reinforcement is delivered. What type of procedure is this? Don't get fooled by this reinforcement schedule. It has nothing to do with the question, okay? It's just details to throw you off, okay? So you're gonna look at FI3 and be like, okay, what is FI3, fixed interval? Don't get bogged down, read the question. We're just looking for the type of procedure, okay? So what are we doing here? We are trying to reinforce students sitting down and not standing up, okay? The first thing you should ask when you're in the DR questions, okay? Can the two behaviors happen at the same time? And if the answer is no, then it's going to be DRI, differential reinforcement of incompatible behaviors. Can you sit down and stand up at the same time? No, right? So our answer has to be A, okay? What is DRO? DRO is the absence of the behavior, okay? So how would we change this to a DRO scenario? If at any time the student is not walking around the room, they're getting reinforced. So regardless of what they're doing, okay, if they're laying on the ground, if they're sitting in their chair, right, if their head is on their desk, then that would be a DRO. DRO is the absence of one behavior, okay? DRA, you would need to find um, a replacement behavior for standing up and walking around the room. Okay, whatever that might be, okay? But in this scenario, that behavior could happen at the same time, okay? And DRL is um, a, a type, but not something you need to worry about, okay? DRI, first question you ask in these D DR situations, can the two behaviors happen at the same time? They can, okay? We know it's not DRI. If they can't, 
Okay, if they can't happen at the same time, then it has to be a DRI, okay? So the answer here is A. 16, your client screams for extended periods of time throughout the day. Your BCBA instructs you to deliver reinforcement anytime the client is not screaming. What type of procedure is this? So what are our questions? For it? It's a DR question, okay? Can screaming, okay, happen, okay? Oh, let's start here. Are we looking at two behaviors, right? No, right? We're looking at screaming, okay? So we don't have a behavior to compare it to. Okay, so start there. We, we don't have a behavior to compare it to. We're just looking at screaming and not screaming, okay? So there's no incompatible behavior and there's no alternative behavior. What are we looking at here? We're looking at the absence of screaming. We're looking at not screaming. And when we're looking at the absence of a behavior, what DR is that? DRO, right? Differential reinforcement of other behavior, okay? So get a very specific way to look at these questions, okay? Because they're easy once you figure them out. So up here, okay, we're looking at two behaviors that can happen at the same time. That has to be inc incompatible. So it has to be a differential re reinforcement of an incompatible behavior. On 16, we're not looking at two behaviors. We're only looking at one behavior, screaming, okay? And we're looking at the absence of screaming. We're looking at not screaming when the client is not doing something. Okay. When they're not doing something <clears throat> and there's one behavior and it's the absence, it has to be DRO. Okay. So DRI, two behaviors that can happen at the same time. DRO, we're looking at one behavior and the absence of that be behavior. The behavior is not happening. Okay. And then 17, Linda elopes from the table when presented with a lengthy task. You start a functional communication training program with Linda and hopes you can teach her to ask for a break. Now, Whenever Linda asks for a break when presented with a lengthy task, you provide reinforcement. What type of procedure is this? So what are we looking at? Okay. Uh, we're looking at eloping. Okay. And we're trying to teach her, okay, instead of eloping, to ask for a break. So what are we looking at? Two behaviors. We're looking at eloping <clears throat> and asking for a break. Can you elope and ask for a break at the same time? Yes, right? I can. I can ask for a break and just get up out my chair without waiting, okay? These two things can happen, okay? So what are we doing? We're trying to replace eloping with this behavior, asking for a break, which is the alternative behavior, which is right in the name, right? Differential reinforcement of alternative behavior, okay? So again, because this is important, I don't want you to miss these, DRI, two behaviors, can't happen at the same time. DRO, one behavior in the absence of that behavior, okay, the behavior when it's not happening, okay. In DRA, DRA, two behaviors that can happen at the same time, okay, but you're only reinforcing the alternative, all right. So these trick people up, okay. Once you get it down though, it's not that difficult, okay. Keep it really simple, all right. 18, in this type of teaching, there is an antecedent, a behavior, a consequence, and a brief pause before the next antecedent. Okay, what type of teaching is there an antecedent, a behavior, a consequence, and a brief pause? Okay, so NET, yeah, there is a behavior usually and a consequence, but NET, you, there's not always a brief pause, right? Because in natural environment training, right? You're just using the environment and using what comes up. So there might be long pauses in between teaching opportunities, okay? FCT, okay, yeah, you know, maybe there's a brief pause before the next antecedent, but it's kind of the same thing, right? You're, if you're teaching them to mand and you're waiting for them to get to, to mand independently and things like that, you can't track this, right? So there's always gonna be an antecedent of behavior and consequence, but the, the key here is a brief pause, right? So it's not FCT, right? We're looking for the best answer prompting. Okay. That's not a, it's not a teaching style. It's part of how we teach, but it's not a style. DTT. Yes. Right. So what is, what is the essence of DTT, right? We have ABC. Okay. So we, we have an antecedent, a behavior, a consequence, brief pause. Okay. And then you deliver the next antecedent behavior consequence. So our antecedent in this situation is the SD, right? So we have the SD, we have the behavior, and then you have reinforcement or feedback. 
you pause and you go on to the next SD, okay? So the key here in this question is a brief pause, right? Because all right, we're always talking about ABCs and teaching, right? But the key in this question and what makes DTT the best is that brief pause, okay? That's the essence of DTT. It's rapid teaching. You want to do a lot of trials very quickly, okay? So tricky question, right? You have to read the whole thing and really understand what they're asking you, okay? When you're looking for the best answer, all right? When should you deliver a prompt? So remember, what, what is a prompt, okay? I see prompting wrong all the time. A lot of people think you prompt after the response, okay? After they do it incorrectly, then you prompt. That is fundamentally incorrect, okay? That's the opposite intended effect of a prompt. What is a prompt, right? Look, your definitions, what is a prompt, right? It's a cue to evoke the behavior you want. So you're basically telling the person the behavior you want to see, and then you can reinforce it, okay? <clears throat> so when should a prompt be delivered? After the consequence. Well, no, because you don't want to prompt them after you've told them what's wrong, because then you can't reinforce, right? So the consequence <clears throat> should follow the prompt, because you want to reinforce the behavior after the prompt. Remember, a prompt, you're just trying to, to get them to do the behavior you want so you can reinforce the right behavior, okay? So it should never come after the consequence. Before the SD. Well, that doesn't make any sense because if I don't, if I prompt before the SD, then they don't know what I'm asking, okay? So I have to ask them to do something first so I can prompt that correct behavior, okay? After the response, no, because, well, no, because we don't want to give them an, an opportunity to, to do the response wrong, okay? So the, we, want, we want to evoke the correct response. That's what I'm trying to, to get you guys to understand. The prompt, when we're prompting, we don't want to give them an opportunity to do it wrong, okay? We really want them, it's like if I say, touch green, okay? And then I point at green, get them to touch green, okay? So we don't want to do it after the response because then after the response, we should be giving corrective feedback, right? We should be giving a consequence after the response and then going back to the antecedent, right? After the SD, before the response. Yes, okay. So what is the proper order? It should go SD, prompt, response, consequence. Okay, so one more time. It's the SD, the prompt, the response, the consequence. Okay, so the prompt almost acts like a second SD. Okay, so think of it that way. The prompt is almost like a second discriminative stimuli. Okay, if you think of it that way, you'll never forget this order. Okay, because if it's a second discriminative stimuli, it has to come after the SD, but before the response. Okay, so just remember that order. The prompt always comes before the response and after the SD, okay? The prompt, you're trying to get this response, okay? So to order, in order to get that response, you have to deliver the prompt before, okay? But after you already told them what to do, okay? So example, I, I have a client, I say, say the word blue, and then I say blue as a prompt. The client says blue, I deliver reinforcement, okay? SD is say blue, prompt is blue, Response is blue, consequence is reinforcement, okay? Don't get too confused with that. Um, I'm just trying to really instill this order, okay? Because prompting gets, is incorrect all the time, okay? Just remember, it never comes after the response, okay? It's never a consequence. Prompting is always before the response, okay? Okay, last one. Billy has soccer practice today. When it's time to leave, Billy's dad tells Billy to grab his soccer bag. Billy complies and grabs his stuff. His dad says, nice job, let's load up the car. In this scenario, what is the antecedent to Billy grabbing his stuff? So in order to get this question right, you need to know what an antecedent is, okay? What is an antecedent? The antecedent happens before the behavior, right? A, B, C, antecedent behavior consequence. So what happened before Billy grabbed his stuff? Let's see, Billy has soccer practice today, okay? When it's time to leave, Billy's tad, dad tells Billy to grab his soccer bag. Billy complies and grabs his stuff. So what happened before he grabbed his stuff? Billy's dad told Billy to grab his soccer bag, okay? So let's look at our answers. Billy has soccer practice today. Yes, but that is not the antecedent 
to grabbing his stuff, okay? Because Billy doesn't grab his, Billy knows he has soccer practice today, right? But he doesn't grab his stuff until something happens. So what is the direct antecedent? What happens right before that behavior, okay? There is no clear antecedent, no. Billy's dad telling Billy to grab his soccer bag. Let's look at it again. Billy's dad tells Billy to grab his soccer bag. Billy complies and grabs his stuff. Yep, so it has to be C, okay? Nice job, let's load up the car. That would be your consequence, okay? Okay, so some difficult questions today. Um, remember, uh, if you have questions, email me. I'm, I'm happy to answer or leave a comment below, okay? I'll respond quickly. If you want access to this exam or the study guide, okay, the links are gonna be below. Um, so please check those out. Uh, I'll put out another set of questions um, next week. Um, until then, uh, good luck, study hard, learn your definitions. Um, and uh, any questions, uh, please let me know. Okay.